So today I'm going to talk about the implications of using animation as a representational strategy in documentaries, in interview documentaries specifically today. So the topic of my talk is uh, something I discuss in the book that I published last year on animated documentary that uh, Christiane just mentioned. Um, in that book I have a whole chapter on interview documentaries and I but more broadly in the book, I investigate the implications of animating documentary and the different ways that animation is used in animated documentaries. Um, I don't really want to spend much time today going over that, but um, just in case some of you are unfamiliar with animated documentaries, because often the response I get when I say that I do research on animated documentaries is like a completely blank and people are like, what, what's that? I've never heard of that. So I thought maybe I'd sort of um, give you some references here. So th what I normally say straight away is, have you seen Waltz with Bashir, the film that came out you know, a few years ago? And lots of people say yes, and I say, well, that, and that kind of helps them understand. And if they say no, then I say, well, do you remember the 1999 Walking with Dinosaurs series the BBC made? And did that have international, did, people, did that kind of? Okay, so maybe that has less currency over here than um, in the UK or US. And then there was another film called Chicago 10. But So these are kind of some examples of mainstream or feature documentaries that have used animation. Um, but what, I'm just, what I put up here is just my definition of animated documentary, just to kind of help uh, sort of give, a, give an understanding of what they are. So how I define them as uh, they are recorded or created frame by frame which is a pretty standard definition of animation. Right? They are about the world rather than a world wholly imagined by its creators. So that's actually kind of stolen from Bill Nichols' definition of documentary more generally. Uh, the third criteria is that they are presented and or received as a documentary. So that can be either they're labeled as animated documentaries by their filmmakers um, or in conference programs or film festivals. And what that helps make a distinction between is something like an animated documentary and an animated film that's meant for advertising or educational purposes, because um, you often get animation used in those contexts as well. And finally, that animation and live action in these animated documentaries converge as a cohesive whole. Uh, so you often get animated documentaries that use both live action film and animation, but those two have to be kind of welded together in a way that you can't sort of separate them out from each other. Um, okay, so that's just a little bit of background. And I'm happy to answer any questions, more general, broad questions people have about animated documentaries and how they work at the end of, of the talk. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is specifically about animated documentaries that represent the interview scene. Or to borrow from pra Patrick's expression yesterday, which I quite liked, films in which animation is used to reconstruct the speaking subject. So, um, let's say so. Bill Nichols has claimed, so Bill Nichols, a theorist of documentary, has claimed that we learn as much from what we see as from what we hear in interview documentaries when he says that unspoken knowledge is conveyed by the body of documentary interviewees. Michael Renov has claimed a similar thing, specifically in reference to the Holocaust documentary Shoah. Renov and Nichols make the claim that the epistemology of testimony in audiovisual documentary or the weight of knowledge of these films is not just conveyed through what the interviewees say, rather the body and gestures of human behavior reveal the truth of testimony. So things like body language, uh, gesture and so on become important conveyors of meaning and truth and knowledge in interview documentaries. And I think that's something, that's something we witnessed say in Dan's film, The Kill Team yesterday the sort of significance of how the interviewees behave on screen is very important in terms of what we, what we kind of understand about what they're saying. So what happens when the physical body is replaced by an animated body in documentary? And in particular, what I'm interested in is what does this mean in terms of the knowledge that animated interview documentaries convey? Okay, so this image you can see up on screen uh, is from a short film called Creature Comforts, which was made by the British company Aardman Animations in 1989. It's a funny and insightful short film, and it won the company the first of its many Academy Awards and brought their work to greater attention, both within the UK and internationally. The film is also significant, I think, because it helped establish the potential for combining 
documentary interview soundtracks with animated visuals. Ardman interviewed people, real people, and used these words to voice various animals in an animation process that has since been labeled as claymation. Uh, Creature Comforts was intended as a comedy short, not an animated documentary. It wasn't labeled as an animated documentary by the filmmakers. Um, uh, they just sort of intended it to be you know, a funny, insightful short. But much of the film's humor and astute observation about the human condition comes from the way that the banal and mundane truths spoken by the interviewees are juxtaposed with the animal counterparts. The use of animation to represent documentary interviewees has gained increasing currency since Creature Comforts was released over two decades ago. Frequently, there are situations in which the identity of interviewees must be protected, and the standard device in live-action documentary is to silhouette the face and body so that we can't see them as a spectator. Animation is a more creative way of achieving such anonymity. Most often, this anonymity is necessary because a film is on a sensitive subject or on something that interviewees would not otherwise be willing to discuss on camera. Um, so here's are some examples up on screen here. Dutch filmmaker Misha Kamp directed six short films under the series titled Naked in 2006, in which preteens talk about the physical and emotional changes of puberty. One could imagine that adolescents would not be as forthcoming on subjects such as sex, menstruation, and pubic hair without the veil of animation. The makers of a more recent film for the BBC in the UK about relationships called The Trouble with Love and Sex, which was animated by Jonathan Hodgson uh, two years ago, believe that their interviewees, who are clients of the UK relationship counselling service called Relate, um, they believe these people would not have agreed to take part in a conventional documentary. The use of animation and the promise that um, their on-screen alter egos would not resemble their real-life counterparts gave them the privacy they needed to talk freely about their most private lives. Another benefit of using animation in interview documentaries is that because animation is not forced to resemble that which it represents, it offers freedom to explore possibilities for not only masking identities, but also interpreting the words of the interviewees and illustrating and conveying a film's themes and issues. So Stranger Comes to Town, which is on the bottom left, is an animated documentary made by Jacqueline Goss in 2007 about how visitors and immigrants to the United States experience crossing the border into the country. So Goss interviewed, uh, she asked her interviewees to choose their own representation in the form of a character from the World of Warcraft video game. And this is how they appear in the film, um, as you can see up on screen. Um, <clears throat> so these representations challenge audience assumptions of someone's physical appearance based on their voice. And it also offers a commentary on US government attitudes towards non-resident aliens, as they call them. At the same time, removing the conventional images of live action talking heads amplifies the importance of the soundtrack in animated interview documentaries. In particular, the voice of the interviewee takes on an additional significance when their face and body remains hidden. So I think here a useful concept is Stephen Connor's concept of the vocalic body. Connor proposed this concept in a discussion of ventriloquism, but I think it applies to the animated bodies in animated interview documentaries in a very useful way. He describes the vocalic body as the idea which can take the form of a dream, fantasy, ideal, theological doctrine, or hallucination of a surrogate or secondary body, a projection of a new way of having or being a body formed and sustained by the autonomous operations of the voice. So I think what Connor is implying here is that voices produce bodies. I guess we often think of it the other way around, like the voice comes out, the voice is coming out of my body right now. But what Connor is suggesting is it can work the other way around. You hear the voice, and if you can't see a body, it kind of produces an idea or an image of the body to you when you hear the voice. So voices produce bodies. We can think of animated embodiments of interview subjects as vocalic bodies, ones that emphasize the autonomy of the voice as expressive and meaningful in its own right, at the same time as adding a dimension of interpretation and sometimes juxtaposition to what is heard. For while animated bodies may sometimes seem to astutely match the voice of the speaker, they are also fundamentally a mismatch by virtue of not being the body of the speaker. 
The use of animation to represent the documentary interview scene could obviously present some problems, right, due to the non-conventional nature of this visual representation, and because it challenges the notion of the importance of the body of the documentary interviewee as a site of knowledge, as suggested by Nichols and Renov, as I mentioned earlier. However, I think that using animation, in fact, can enhance the meaning of an interview documentary. And what I'm going to do now is explore some examples in more depth that do that. I'm going to talk about two overarching themes in particular. Firstly, what I'm going to do is look at how absence itself can be a useful representational strategy and at the socio-political significance of replacing real bodies with animated ones. Then secondly, I'll look at how the voice becomes an important tool of expressive meaning in animated interview documentaries. Okay, so absence as a representational strategy. There is a politics associated with visibility and conversely with invisibility. To have a presence, you must be visible. To have a say, you must be both seen and heard. Much activist film and video from the 1970s onwards works from this premise of raising awareness through raising visibility and vice versa. Jane Gaines has suggested that the power of political documentaries to affect change relies on the presence of the on-screen bodies for the audience to mirror um, in an act of what she calls political, mim mim sorry, political mimesis. And this is kind of what Patrick was getting at yesterday, this idea of documentary as a body genre. You kind of, that's what Jane Gaines is talking about in that article. It's kind of like you're physically sort of you know, drawn to respond to what you see on screen, kind of rise up in political revolution to what you see on screen um, in the same way that you might be sort of you know, physically re responding with tears to a melodrama. Um, and so it seems then that documentary's role in the political sphere is intrinsically bound up with the presence of the body. Yet this relationship between documentary embodiment and visibility is called into question by the increasing number of animated interview documentaries that engage with socio-political issues. Animation masks the real people, making them invisible to viewers. And so this very idea would seem to exacerbate their underrepresentation and lack of voice in mainstream media. This notion becomes even more acute in the light of claims such as Jane Gaines' claim regarding the importance of the presence of the body. So how much power can we say is being claimed or afforded to people who remain invisible to us? Films that replace the bodies of those who are already marginalized in society with animated characters could be open to the criticism of depoliticizing and disempowering their subjects through animating their physical form. Similarly, if, as Bill Nichols claims, meaning is conveyed through the physical actions and gestures of the documentary interviewee, what sort of knowledge and meaning can be conveyed when the interviewee is animated? So when David Aronowicz and Hannah Heilborn interviewed a young Peruvian refugee named Giancarlo in 1999 for their animated documentary Hidden, which you can see on the top left, there were concerns for the anonymity of the interviewee and his family. Their status as illegal immigrants meant that their identity had to be kept secret in order to protect them from deportation, a threat that loomed constantly over their life in Sweden. In the eight minute short film, uh, the subjects are animated in a simple two-dimensional style. They are drawn in a childlike fashion with bold outlines marking their body and facial features, as you can see up here on the screen. The family sit around a large table in an otherwise empty room. Giancarlo's younger siblings sit next to him, drawing quietly with a pen and paper, as you can see there. And his mother stands in the background, silently rocking a young baby. The film is based on audio interviews recorded by Aronowicz and Heilborn, and it doesn't have any filmed material as its basis. Um, they never filmed Giancarlo. Hidden is rejecting one of the traditional conventions of anonymity in documentary, that of filming an interviewee and silhouetting them so that their features cannot be identified. Instead, animation becomes a way of preserving the subject's anonymity at the same time as conveying the film's themes of isolation, loneliness, and desperation. Giancarlo's physical absence from the film mirrors his lack of legitimate physical presence in Sweden. This idea is particularly emphasized in two live action sections of the film. So at one point, Giancarlo speaks of the difficulty of fitting in at school. And we see images of children running through a hallway and taking their seats in a classroom. Giancarlo is superimposed onto these live action images in an animated form. And he's kind of this flimsy uh, little two dimensional figure in a really bustling, busy three dimensional world. 
So I'm just going to show you the first couple of minutes of the film, um, and you'll see this sequence. <clears throat> En el transcurso del año, nosotros eh, pudimos ajuntar su pasaje de él, Giancarlo. Yo visto ni un tino, no un tino, le son. Más te falso, yo visto ni un Yo voy a consumir. Hur länge har du levt hem nu? Jag är ungefär vid um, tio tusen år. Vid två år någonting. Hur många gånger har du flyttat? Minst två gånger tror jag. Dina klasskamrater vet inte om? Ja, jag är rädd ibland att de misstänker oss. Jag brukar vara långt ifrån dem ibland. Vad är du rädd för att de ska göra då? Menar du om de skulle få veta? Nej, att det är kanske deras föräldrar eller några poliser. Alltså. Att deras föräldrar är poliser? Mm. Ja, de, de var varför säger han ingen adress när man är uppropar och allting. De misstänker ibland. Det var så att en gång jag gick till skolan efter utvisningen så efter lång stund. Och då de sa till mig att polisen hade kommit till. Okej. Så, thanks. Um, so you can see there how the animation is kind of juxtaposed with the live action, how it becomes symbolic or metaphoric of Giancarlo's uh, situation. It's Like That um, is a similar, well, it's a film about a similar subject matter. It was made uh, a little later in Australia, um, and it's about a group of young asylum seekers who are kept in detention centers in Australia. The film is based on phone interviews conducted between the filmmakers and the interviewees. They never met them in, in person. They were never able to film them. And this film also, similarly to It's Like That, uses a kind of symbolism or metaphor in its style of animation. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a very short clip of this film to give you an idea of how they animate the characters. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of what it looks like. It's hard to hear what they're saying, um, just because of their, they have very strong accents and the sound record, the quality of the sound recording isn't very good because it was over a telephone. Um, but you can see from that short clip, right, the symbolism and the metaphor of these little knitted birds. These, the, the children are animated as small birds all the way throughout the film in different styles, but the most predominant or noticeable technique is this stop motion animation of these small knitted puppets which are obviously kind of uh, reminiscent of you know, small, soft, cuddly toys that children carry around with them. And they look very innocent and vulnerable. And in part, that is achieved by they're always filmed from above, as you can see in this still here. Um, okay, so 
Both It's Like That and Hidden um, are bringing stories to light that might otherwise not be heard. Okay, so they're giving a voice to these children who are underrepresented in media. But what this actually emphasizes is the unequal power relationship between the interviewee and the interviewer, something that Foucault observed regarding the confession. And what Foucault talks about, and when he was talking about confessions, was that it's always the inquisitor, not the confessor, who has the power in part because the inquisitor is deciding kind of what questions to ask, but also, um, and I think this is represented in what Dan was talking about yesterday when he showed us the raw footage of those interviews and then we saw the complete film obviously before, that Dan was making the decisions about what would stay in and what would stay out of that film. So ultimately the power is with the inquisitor or the documentary filmmaker about what they do with that information um, that is gained from the interview. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> a less politically charged example is Backseat Bingo, uh, which is a film by Liz Blazer from 2003 on the right there. In this film, uh, residents of a retirement community, so older people, uh, are talking about their relationships and more specifically about their sex lives. Okay, so anonymity was a condition of the participants uh, being involved in this film. They, these residents of the retirement community said, they would only be interviewed if they weren't gonna be seen on screen because they didn't wanna talk about you know, their sex lives and what they really got up to in this retirement community um, if people were really gonna see their faces. So Liz said, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm, I, you know, she was an animator anyway, so she wanted to make an animated film about them. So that was fine and she interviewed them and um, then she produced this animated version. And there's a real kind of joie de vivre in their voices. And this is matched by the animation style, which is really playful and youthful and bright. Um, and so let's just watch a little clip. Um, we'll watch like the last minute and a half or so of that film. It'll give you an idea of the style. And then she does something very interesting, I think, in the credits of the film. took off my wedding ring and I said to myself, I wonder what's around the corner for me. And I think instead of sitting and saying, oh, he died, da, 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 I always look forward. The person in my age who has the capacity of doing sex, this is the highest thing in the world the greatest achievement in the world. And the pleasure is unbelievable. This business of saying a man uses a woman for a one-nighter, what about a woman using a man? Is that terrible? <laughs> <laughs> Kushmir and Tokas arrived. You know what that means? I hate to tell you. Kiss my you-know-what. <laughs> it is, when you say it in English, it sounds bad, right? But in Jewish, it's kind of cute. And someone says something to you, you say, yeah, Kushmer and Tukhasarai, kind of cute, you know? <laughs> Okay, so they saw the film and they loved it, um, and they said, "Yeah, well, they wanted. They were happy for their photos to appear, and they kind of wanted to be credited because they thought the film was so great. So they were happy. They wanted their photos to be at the end of the film. So what that? I mean, it's a really delightful film, um, anyway. But what that kind of creates for us is this moment where you see the real person at the end of the film. You're like, oh, that's what they really look like. But and you can tell who is who from the animated version." So this is Ruth Cooper here, who you saw in the photos at the end. And so you, she looks a little like the real Ruth Cooper. But obviously all the wrinkles are gone, and it's a much more kind of youthful version. Um, so the photos at the end reveal these kind of aged, sort of decrepit bodies. But the animation sort of challenges our preconception of the aging body as a desexualized one. Um, the voc and I think in this film, the vocalic bodies of the animation match much more accurately the voices of the interviewees than their real bodies perhaps do, right? Okay, so just to kind of sum up what I've been talking about in this little section on absence of representational strategy. Um, the absence of 
bodies is often in itself a socio-political metaphor. I've talked about the reasons why Giancarlo and the other children in It's Like That couldn't be shown on screen. In Backseat Bingo, it's much more about the kind of social taboo of old people having, older people having a sex life. Um, but animated bodies are as, if not more, revealing of unspoken knowledge as the interview, interviewees' real bodies might have been. And also, and this leads me on to my next section, um, the voice itself is really powerfully expressive in these films. So you have the, joy, the joyful, youthful voices of backseat bingo, and in It's Like That and Hidden, you have very fearful, um, innocent, childlike, sort of subdued voices, um, which becomes very telling to us as an audience about what life is like for these children. So now what I want to do is think a little bit more about the expressive power of the disembodied voice by looking at another film called His Mother's Voice, which was made by Australian animator Dennis Tupikoff in 1997. Dennis was a real trailblazer in the animated documentary. Around 1997 and 1998, there was a real, there was a kind of little mini explosion of animated documentaries with several significant films being made in those years. And Dennis was one of the first people to really kind of explore the application of animation to documentary. So a little background on this film, uh, it, it was a radio interview originally. Dennis heard this radio interview sitting in his kitchen one day in which a woman talks about one night where she receives a phone call telling her that her teenage son has been shot. And the, in this interview, she talks about rushing to the scene where he was shot and waiting to find out what's happened and then ultimately finding out that he has died. Um, so we hear that through two times, her radio interview, which is about seven and a half minutes long. We hear it all the way through once and then all the way through again. And each of those two times is animated in a different style, which you can see on the screen on the left-hand side. So the top half is what it looks like first time round, and the bottom half is what it looks like second time round. So in the first time, we see a reconstruction of the actual night itself, of her receiving the news, rushing to the interview scene. And it's animated in a bold comic book style. Um, and then the second half of the film is a reconstruction of her being interviewed. And it's drawn in charcoal, um, it's kind of, it looks sort of jittering, uh, sort of wob wobbly, the frame is wobbly, and that's in part achieved through the technique of animation that Dennis Tupikoff used, which is called animating on twos, which means you film each frame for two seconds. Um, sorry, you film each drawing for two frames, sorry, rather. Um, uh, okay, so the film in itself is, t it's, the whole thing is 15 minutes long, um, and what I'm going to do now is show you the first couple of minutes of the first half and then the first couple of minutes of the second half so you can see how the two styles compare. Um. gone to bed and the phone rang um, just not long, I guess it was not long after midnight and it was Mrs. Booth on the other end and she was like sc screaming and she was saying Kathy Matthews been shot please come quickly and um, you know I felt like my um, my heart and my body disconnected and I just like drove um, just Wait. drove over to Mrs. Booth's and um, when I got there one of the boys that was with Matthew had run back and um, I asked him I, the first thing I asked him was is Matthew okay and he said yes and I said where has he been shot and he said in the shoulder and um, I so I thought oh he's okay and so um, I jumped in my car and I raced up and I go, I said, Where's, where is it? And then they told me, and, and um, someone had to give me directions because I couldn't, uh, my brain wouldn't work to find it in the Refidex. I couldn't, I couldn't, I was really disoriented. And someone gave me like the practical directions and I 
just followed. And I got there and I could see all the police cars, all the lights and the, and the, the kids that they were with had all gathered outside the home. And I jumped out of the car and I, and I, saw, I saw a policeman and I said, um, um, is he all right? And they said, uh, and they asked who I was and I said, I'm your mum. I said, please, can I go in and see him? And they said, no, can you please wait over there? And I went over where all the kids were and, and I felt like, like I needed to keep it together, uh, and not, not to lose it, just keep it all together. And I was trying to find out what had happened. And, and what, you know, what one boy had already said, okay, he shot in the shoulder. And then I asked. How did you first learn about Matthew's death? Uh, I'd gone to bed and the phone rang, um, just not long, I guess it was not long after midnight, and it was Mrs Booth on the other end and she was like sc screaming and she was saying, Kathy, Matthew's been shot, please come quickly. And, um, you know, I felt like my, um, my heart and my body disconnected and I just like drove, um, just Wait. drove over to Mrs. Booth's and um, when I got there one of the boys that was with Matthew had run back and um, I asked him, I, the first thing I asked him was, is Matthew okay? And he said yes, and I said where's he been shot? And he said in the shoulder. And um, so I thought, oh, he's okay. And so um, I jumped in my car and I raced up. Like I, I said, Where's, where is it? And they told me and, and um, someone had to give me directions because I couldn't, uh, my brain wouldn't work to find it in the record I couldn't, I couldn't, I was really disoriented. And someone gave me like the practical directions and I just followed. And I got there and I could see all the, Okay, so that gives you an idea. That gives you first one. That gives you an idea of how the film uh, works as constructed. Um, so it's created using rotoscoping. You know that style of animation where you film something first and then you trace over it to create the animation. And then once you've traced it, you can do whatever you want with the style of animation, as Dennis has done in these two film in these two halves. Uh, but it was the original filmed footage was reconstructed by actors. So Dennis uh, never met Kathy Easdale, the mother of the boy who was shot and killed. He just got in touch with her after he heard the radio interview. I think he wrote to her and said, I want to make an animated film of this interview. And she said, okay. And uh, he sent her a copy of the finished film and he's never heard from her. He's never had a response from her about the film. Um, so he never met her. He has no idea what her house looks like or what was inside it. Um, he had no idea what Matthew, her son, looked like. Um, so it's, uh, the film, I think, is impactful for two key reasons. One is the way that Kathy speaks, the way the mother Kathy speaks, and also the way the, an the film is animated, and really importantly, how these two things interact, the voice and the animation. So much of the power of his mother's voice derives from the evocative nature of Kathy's intonation, which I'll talk more about in a second. But it also comes from the style of animation and the particular, if different, um, aesthetics of the two rotoscoped halves. The stark contrasts, bold colors, and clear outlines of the reconstruction of the night of Matthew's death give the way to the monochrome charcoal depiction of the interview in Kathy's home. In the first half, the harsh horror of that night is shown through the graphic animation style and shots that accentuate key moments and objects, 
The telephone on which Cathy receives news of Matthew's death is animated in a bright blood red, a solitary object casting a dark shadow on a white background. When Matthew's brother falls to the ground upon news of his death, and this happens towards the end of the interview, his brother is a lone blue figure in a sea of blue background. The camera pans around and underneath him as he rises up in a silent roar of grief. The only break from the reenactment of that night's events is a fleeting moment, a wishful, hopeful moment, in which Matthew appears alive and well and animated in a very different style, which you can see on the right of the screen. It's a softer style with a lively color palette and none of the harsh black shadow seen in the rest of this first half of the film. By the second time we hear the interview, the words are now familiar and the shock factor of the revelation of the events and Matthew's death is superseded by the rawness of Kathy's grief. As we saw, the scene begins with Kathy being interviewed before the camera pans off to begin its roam around the house, scanning over the Jimi Hendrix poster in Matthew's room, the M emblazoned mug in the windowsill, looking over the fence at the neighbor's house. The soundtrack in this half of the film is layered with the diegetic sounds of the surroundings. Birds are heard cawing, wind chimes tinkling, dogs barking. The mundaneness of what is seen, the everyday nature of this suburb, is at odds with the story being told, a story of lives changing irrevocably or ceasing altogether. The film's palpable and acute sense of Kathy's loss is accentuated through Kathy's physical presence. As I said, she never met Kathy, uh, sorry, the filmmaker never met Kathy. Um, the interview wasn't filmed at her house, um, and Dennis Tupikoff had no idea what her house really looked like. So Dennis Tupikoff has described the film as being twice removed from the events being described first by the reenactments and then by the animation itself. Joanna Baldwin has pointed out that there is a kind of transference of corporeality from real body to animated body in rotoscoped animation. The process of tracing over live action imagery retains some of the physical weight of the original image, despite the absence of any filmed material in the final result. And Ardman Animation's David Sproxton has suggested that an uncanny oddness arises from traditionally rotoscoped images because they contain an excess of information due to the ability to too faithfully transcribe the movement and behavior of a subject. This uncanny corporeality is especially excessive in his mother's voice because it is the trace of an actor's body, not the body associated with the voice we hear on the soundtrack. The rotoscope carries with it the ghostly trace of bodies that were anyway standing in for others. <coughs> excuse me. And on, top of, and on top of that, if you excuse that pun, I don't know if that works, um, if you're not an English speaker, but on top of that, we must contend with two different animation aesthetics that reflect Tupikov's interpretation of the double event of the film, the night of the shooting and the day of the interview. So while the film is twice removed from events, as Tupikov suggests, it is also doubly representing them. And this absence of filmed bodies and live action footage and excess of rotoscoped bodies and drawing styles is something that plays an integral part in our interpretation of Kathy's story. I just want to digress just for a second here. So this idea of absence and excess is something that I say characterizes animated documentaries, generally speaking, not just interview documentaries, but this kind of absence of what we would expect to see, so the live action footage of a, norm, of a conventional documentary, and then this excess of animation, which is always goes above and beyond just representing the, 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 the reality, if you like. Because there's always an element of style and choice and technique um, and aesthetics that comes with animation. So all animated documentaries are characterized by absence and excess, and that's what makes them, I think, interesting and sort of challenging for us as viewers, because we're forced to sort of work out what's happening, work out what we're meant to be interpreting from these films and what the animation means. So we do not see Kathy's real body in the film, but we do hear her real voice. And without that voice, we can safely say, say that the film wouldn't be as powerful as it is. There is something more than information being conveyed in Kathy's words. Her delivery, her hesitation as she tries to describe her feelings at hearing Matthew has been shot, her faltering voice as she talks about the period between learning of the shooting and finally being told he was dead, the timber of her voice tells us more than just the facts. Her voice evokes and embodies her emotional response to the events. Yet this emotional knowledge is, in its own way, unspoken. 
It is less through her words that we get a sense of how awful that night was, but more through how she says them. It is the voice rather than the words it speaks that conveys Cathy's experience. So Michelle Chion, Malaudin Dola, and Roland Barthes have all drawn our attention to the fact that the human voice has an expressive potential that goes beyond the words spoken. So Chion and Dola have talked about um, the sort of the, uh, the voiceover of, or sort of the absent, um, the absent body, if you like, in feature films. And Roland Barthes, as Patrick was talking about yesterday, uh, has this concept of the grain of the voice and the, the sort of uh, inherent quality of a voice that tells us about its speaker. Um, so as we have seen, the expressive potential of the voice um, is apparent in the films uh, we discussed earlier. So the vibrant, colorful, animated bodies in backseat bingo are vocalic bodies by virtue of representing the youthful and playful voices. The vulnerability and lack of agency of the juvenile interviewees in Hidden and It's Like That is conveyed through their childlike intonation. Michel Chion's term, the acousmetra, describes a voice that has not yet been visualized, that is, when we cannot yet connect it to a face. Such voices can be distinguished from the voiceover commentators in the following way. We may define it as neither inside nor outside the image, it is not inside because the image of the voice's source, the body, the mouth, is not included, nor is it outside since it is not clearly positioned off screen in an imaginary wing. It is implicated in the action, constantly about to be part of it. This concept of voices of absent, soon to be, or nearly present bodies is significant in understanding the power of Kathy Easdale's voice in his mother's voice. Dola has suggested that the evocative capacity of the voice is heightened by those that are acousmatic. When the voice is separated from the body, it is powerful because it, not can, sorry, powerful because it cannot be neutralized within the framework of the visible, and it makes the visible itself redoubled and enigmatic. This power is divested once the acousmetra becomes visualized sound, that is, a voice whose source can be seen on screen. So the power and potential of the acousmatic voice is complicated in his mother's voice because the voice is, it becomes a non-acousmatic voice, it is de-acousmatized, um, for want of a less clunky term, but via a body that is not Kathy's body. Kathy's voice is assigned to a body to which it does not belong, that of an actress, and then animated and brought to life in a process that further removes it from its original embodiment. Okay, so what can we say in conclusion about the disembodied voice and animation in animated interview documentaries? The importance of sound and its primacy as a documentary indicator is acknowledged directly in several of the films I've discussed today. In Hidden, the interviewers are included as characters in the scene and co-director Aronowicz is adorned with the paraphernalia of sound recording, headphones, tape deck, microphones, as you can see on the top here. His mother's voice begins with a shot of the radio on which Dennis Tupikoff heard the interview with Kathy Easdale for the first time sitting in his kitchen in Australia, as you can see in the bottom right. These images are hints to how animated interview documentaries assert the significance of sound, and in particular, the recorded voice. These voices of absent bodies, sorry, these are voices of absent bodies, bodies that are represented in animation that reflects, interprets, and imagines the participants as vocalic bodies. The use of animation as a representational tool for documentary interviews both responds to and exceeds the present voices and absent bodies of the interviewees. In keeping the identities of the participants hidden, it also adds meaning and significance to the testimonies heard on the soundtrack. Thank you. <laughs> Just go to the chairs. Uh, we need two volunteers for the microphones. I'm going to give one to you. <coughs> Do you want that one? Thank you. The power of sound or <laughs> of the voice. When when I listen to you, it's something is strikes me that uh, I think it's quite important that I learned before 
in, in conferences here, and that is that the audio or the sound is actually where the authentic or the authenticity is. <coughs> uh, so as a documentary filmmaker, we could probably forget about the image. Sure. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> but it, it's like the, the important thing that because it's immersive, we cannot help to sort of start to imagine bodies because the body is some way in the sound itself. If, if you look at an instrument, a very small instrument, has a, has a particular sound, a very, a very large instrument has a different sound. And we can, it has to do with the size of the body, the shape of the body. We sort of can imagine that, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Absolutely, that's spot on, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, <don't laughs> I just, I think that for me, this is, is, is really important to, to know that, and it, it's why it works, I guess, the, the animated documentaries. Why it works. Oh, that's... Uh, because sound is the, uh, the more authentic okay, so means to, to transport, you know, authenticity. Yeah, I suppose you could, yeah, so you're saying the sound has to be there for it to be a documentary, for it to be called an animated documentary. Is that the point you're getting at? Or the, a little bit, for it yeah. To be a yeah, a little bit. They, they, are, they, they all were authentic, and I thought yeah. it's really incredible. Yeah. The based on sound. So the sound is the important thing, that it works. Yeah, I think, you know, the sound, the fact that the sound is documentary sound is, yeah. It, mm -hmm. I, I know, I get asked this sometimes, and there are examples of animated documentaries where... There are animated visuals, and an actor has also spoken the words of the interviewee, for example. Um, but they're still the words of the interviewee. But I think perhaps those are slightly less powerful than an example like the ones I show today, where you are hearing the actual interviewee's voices. So, yeah, I think I'm agreeing with you that I think the sound is really important. I mean, that's one of the things I talk about in the talk and in my yeah. book, that... Yeah. I think sound is often neglected in um, documentary studies in particular, uh, not necessarily by documentary filmmakers to whom it's clearly very important recording the sound, but in the way that people have talked about documentaries and tried to understand documentaries, sound is often a very neglected area of that. It's beginning to be studied more now. But I, what I wanted to draw attention to in this talk and also in this chapter in my book is hang on, we need to, let's think about how the sound works and let's think about how, in particular, let's think about how voices work and how important they are. Um, because often we, we don't pay that much attention to them when they're mm -hmm. matched with a live action face. Now, you, you talked about rotoshopping and... Rotoscoping, yeah. Rotoscoping. Mm. Uh, that's uh, rotoscoping is something different. Mm. Yeah, this is what I w wanted to go to. You can do it automatically today. Sort of transfer digital images <coughs> into drawings. Is, is that something that's, that's been done... Uh, often? Um, there is a... Um, there's a filmmaker called um, Bob Saberston who did the animation for A Scanner Darkly. I don't know if anyone's seen that film. Um, a Scanner Darkly and, Awa and Waking Life. And he... Um, he invented a piece of software called Rotoshop, which is what you just said. Oh, yeah, okay. Rotoshop, which is a... Um, he, he owns it and he's the only person who's allowed to use it. And he's used it in his own short films to make animated short documentaries. And it's kind of automatic in that, but you still need an animator to trace it over. But what the Rotoshop program does is it kind of guesses. You just need to draw, you need a human being to draw key frames, and then the computer will guess the kind of 20 frames in between. So it speeds up the, you don't have to trace every single yeah. frame. But it's not completely automatic. Okay. Um, and in, in, in those short films, but he uses different, lots of different animators yeah. work on the films, and they have very different styles. I mean, post-production programs and also editing programs, yeah. they have filters that, that yeah. sort of uh, act, make an abstraction of the, of the image, and then yeah. it looks like a drawing. What I'm getting at now is, is it necessary to, to have an abstraction, or can the drawing be very close to the actual human being? You know, is, is, is there a... Sure, it can be. It can be. Why but not? How about the uncanny valley? The, that, you, that it becomes, also das heißt, das ist, das ist uh, unheimlich wird, yeah, uncanny, unheimlich, uh, yeah. uh, you know, because it's so close to a human being. Uh, is that something that, that you uh, I, yes, encountered? I, yeah. when, when it's very close? Because some of them were quite abstract, you know, quite far yeah. away from the... Yep. I think the uncanny valley or the unheimlich tends to happen more in CGI animation, okay. um, like 
The Polar Express. I don't know if you remember that film or um, Beowulf, uh, the Zemeckis adaptation of Beowulf, where you're trying to get a CGI construction of a human being and make it look as lifelike as possible. Yeah. And then all you, all you notice as a viewer are the unlifelike aspects, like the eyes are often okay. really dead. CGI is computer animation, also yeah. 3D computer. So uh, that hasn't been used that much in animated documentaries. Okay. So okay. in the Bob Sabaston shorts I was talking about, you don't really get the sense of the uncanny because they're, 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 they're not so close to being lifelike that you, can't, you cannot tell the difference. Yeah. You can always tell they're animated. So. Yeah. But I think there's a different... I mean, we're getting a little bit too technical, perhaps. I mean, I think there is an element of the uncanny, but I think it's less to do with that and it's more to do with kind of... Uh, the expectations right. of the audience that perhaps we're getting a little bit off topic, a bit too technical. Yeah, personal <laughs> interest. Yeah. Uh, questions from you? Sure. I don't, uh, I don't have a question, but a remark, because uh, uh, the first question was, uh, Christian, uh, what is more important, the, the image or the sound? And I think they have both are important for different things to make it easy. It's more complicated. I would say that. The sound is important for transporting the emotion, and the visual, visual thing is important to transport the, the, the thought, the, the cognitive level. So, of course, it's more complicated, but this gives sure. already four possibilities instead of two. Mm -hmm. Questions? Maybe I have a question. Yeah. Um, what do you know about... Um, we were talking of authenticity. Has it to do with the organ? That the ear is a different organ than the eye? You know what I mean? That with the ear we cannot select what comes in is there. Um, what, is, is that what makes the sound more authentic? That's my question. Um, I don't know, it, it don't might know. be. I don't know, I mean, I think the sound is authentic because it is genuinely authentic in these instances. I mean, it is the kind of documentary sound. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily because those kind of senses work differently. I don't know. We looked at it last year when we were talking about sound design. And what we said there is that, that you, you can't help sort of uh, receiving uh, sound. It's very immersive. There's, there's, it, is, it, is, it is on a different level, like images you process in a different way, whereas sound is more directly. It's, it's like on a sub-layer where the image is a little bit on top, but that's neurology now. It, yeah. But it, 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 it's a more direct way to... to I think that explains why mm. the sound can be, so, or the voice in particular, can be so evocative, so it can have such an emotional reaction for yeah. us, right? Because I think of that, to do with that immersiveness yeah. and the fact that we can't yeah. tune it out. Somebody, Marcy. So once again, first of all, thanks for the great presentation and sharing all these lovely examples with us. My question goes away a little bit from the topic of interview. I'm wondering if you'd like to say something about the role that music plays um, in some of these cases. We saw it a little bit in the Tupikov example that there's this very evocative uh, guitar music um, and in Waltz with Bashir, it's also a very important element. Where does music fit in on this spectrum between the authentic and the fictional? Gosh, um, it's a really good question, Marcy, thank you. Uh, I think it's, again, music is something that's been slightly neglected in documentary studies, um, although there's a good book, uh, well, I think it's gonna be good, at least, um, an edited collection um, by Holly, you had her here a couple Holly of years. Rogers. Holly Rogers, yeah. um, who's a British academic. Uh, has done an edited collection on music and documentary because again it's been kind of not studied that much and I think well where does it so where does it fall on that spectrum of you know authentic to fictional I mean I think it's fictional obviously and I think a response I've often had to Dennis Tupikov's film to his mother's voice is people have a real problem not real but people find the sound the, sorry the music really um, invasive and, dis and sort of too manipulative and uh, too kind of disruptive and distracting. That's the word I'm looking for, distracting. It's that guitar music is really kind of full on in that first half. And I would sort of agree with you know, that maybe not being the best creative choice that Dennis made in that film. Um, 
so I think that, you know, and we're clearly sort of, he's trying to kind of amp up the sort of drama, if you like, of that half of the film. Um, so I think that it's, it's a good thing to draw our attention to, the, how the music works to evoke an emotional response from us um, and how that might be sort of maybe manipulating a response from um, a viewer in the same way that it does in fiction film. Time is already up. Thank you very much for your very clear... Uh, Did I speak slowly enough? Did I uh, speak slow enough? Can you speak fast? Can I speak just really fast? I just, can speak really, really fast example. if you want me to. I normally <laughs> it speak It was quite really fast for us, but it was okay. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. oh, sorry, that's yeah. about as slow as okay. I can go. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Es geht weiter um drei. Jetzt ist eine Pause von, naja, ein bisschen mehr als zehn Minuten.